Hello, this is Michael Novenson with Information Security Media Group. I'm joined today by Matt Moynihan. He is President and CEO of OneSpan. Good morning, Matt. How are you? Great, great, Michael. Thanks for having me this morning. Thanks so much for making the time. You've started as CEO at, at, at OneSpan just about a year ago, November of 2021. And I want to get a sense from you of some of the biggest changes or areas of investment that you've had since joining the company. Yeah, no, no, great. Yeah, November 29th marks the one-year anniversary and uh, couldn't be more thrilled to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's probably one of the most fun jobs I've ever had, um, really taking uh, one span with Vasco Data Security before they rebranded to a one span a couple of years ago. Uh, long, proud, his 30-year history in the identity verification, authentication, and transaction signing space with uh, obviously a leadership position in the global banking and financial services. And uh, interestingly enough, the other side of the company was uh, essentially an e-signature provider, you know, an enterprise class e-signature. And we've been hard at work fusing those two things together. And so a lot of the investment has been around creating a cloud-based capability that allows us to secure the entire customer transaction lifecycle, which is really where we're appointing the company to be a sort of a Web 3.0 security company that allows uh, us to take all the uh, products and, and services that we have and stitch them together to do something what I think no other security company has done to date, which is secure customers as they go through the entire cradle to cradle uh, life cycle with enterprises online. I see, I see. And what are some of the issues that you've had to navigate as you try to bring those two disparate sides of the business together? Well, you know, it's a great question. I mean, security has always been around point products for the most part. It's been very hard. Customers have been forced to stitch together uh, the various types of security capabilities end to end. And in this new Web 3.0 world we, we we live in, which is incredibly dynamic, uh, and obviously even will become more so when the metaverse comes around, you know, the old static model of stitching together these things doesn't uh, create a good user experience. And so I think the world needs a you know, security capability that is seamlessly integrated and interwoven across each step of the uh, workflow uh, so that it is hidden, but at the same time delivers a high degree of security as opposed to, you know, a good example would be people sending step up multi-factor authentication to it really disrupts the user experience. You have to go get your phone, you have to do whatever. So it really has been, um, you know, bringing together the capabilities the company has in a way that's hidden to the end user, but done in, a, in an enterprise class fashion. How's the dawn of Web3 and the uh, upcoming arrival of the metaverse affected the work that you do at one span? Well, just it's an extension, right? So, you know, identity is going to be at the core of everything. I mean, you've seen the explosion in the identity market, whether it's the identity you know, access management or CIAM, consumer uh, identity and access management, which it hasn't really taken off that much. But, um, you know, uh, you know, all customers uh, want to on all companies want to onboard customers, right? In order for them to grow, they're going online with more complex digital products. Those products are increasingly expected to be online by consumers. Uh, but there's a lot of regulatory and security threats when you're onboarding an unknown entity to a company, you know, whether to be, you know, uh, you know, a hacker or, you know, infrastructure compromise or just the KYC, know your customer regulations that exist globally. And so, you know, uh, web, uh, the metaverse is really just an extension of another medium, you know, physical, digital and meta in which identity needs to be stitched together across all three. And then obviously you want to transact with those identities to go generate revenue and customer relationships. So uh, I'm, I'm excited for it. I don't know, uh, you know what it will be, uh, but I certainly can see use cases where um, you know, uh, you're going to need to make sure that that identity, that singular identity is fused across multiple mediums to make sure that both security and regulatory uh, issues are addressed. Back in September, you launched the virtual room. A two-part question for you. I was wondering, first, what was the impetus for that? And secondly, what are some of the most interesting ways you've seen the virtual room used since its launch? You know, I, I'm super bullish uh, on this on this capability. In fact, it was started before I arrived. So there's, a, you know, I, I give the team a lot of credit. You know, essentially, we're just getting going in the notion of securing the virtual world. Uh, you know, I was in an investor meeting the other day on a Zoom call. There was three boxes up here, uh, like like you see with us today. Um, and then another box came up with no video. And I went to navigate and look at who that was because I didn't see anybody. And the person's name was Sean Williams. And a voice came on and said, hey, it's not Sean, it's Mike. And I said, how the hell do I know? In fact, I don't know any of you, right? So if you look at what's happening, 
you know, even with a Twitter, with Elon Musk putting out there, you're going to go charge for a verified account and then pulling back. He pulled back recently because he was afraid of brands and enterprises and people being impersonated. No one knows who anyone is. So I don't even, I mean, I've met you before. We've actually met physically, right? But had I not met you, uh, you know, you don't know. And the consequences are high. You know, Web 3.0 is all about uh, deep fakes and fake content and fake artifacts. And if you look at what the hacker community is doing um, in criminal organizations, they're, you know, impersonating, whether it be web infrastructure or people. And so, you know, I think we're just getting going. A virtual room was meant to be a secure environment to conduct business, right? Zoom is, uh, you know, Zoom is not that, right? And I think uh, our goal was to fuse the infrastructure required for companies to engage with customers and features like co-browsing and document signing and whatever it may be, but it's offering that secure uh, secure experience that uh, obviously can hold up in a court of law if for some reason, you know, something happens. I wanted to ask as well from a personnel standpoint, I know OneSpan's made a lot of C-suite hires since you arrived as CEO. Uh, what, what were you looking for as you brought additional folks into the leadership team and what made some of these individuals stand out? Yeah, no. So, you know, for me, culture is everything, right? I, I don't want to be at a company I don't want to work at. <laughs> so number one is getting a great culture in place that, you know, is motivating to me personally, as much as all the employees. Um, you know, uh, one span isn't that big of a company, right? You know, we're about a thousand professionals. So I call us sort of a tweener company, right? And our goal is to go from two to 500 million and then to a billion. And to do that, we have to have people that are really sort of owner operator mindset, uh, have seen enough scale to know what it means to get to 500 million, uh, but not such a big company person that they're uh, become just a people manager and not a doer. And, you know, we're sort of a, a big startup uh, is sort of the mentality we're trying to have here and uh, just strike the balance between uh, folks who have had scale experience and, and the, those that are still have that startup mentality willing to work hard and, and manufacture outcomes, which is a little bit different than, you know, maybe some of the larger organizations who have different types of structures and, and need more, uh, you know, more professional uh, sort of line managers, if you will. We're trying to be doers and managers at the same time here. What's been the fastest growing part of the OneSpan business in 2022 and what have been the drivers of that growth? Yeah, we've had, uh, fortunately, uh, we have uh, sort of two two sides to the house that are being fused together. The security side, right, which has been incredibly stable despite the macroeconomic uh, downturn, uh, because most of what we do with identity verification and authentication is tied to online banking, right? So that's been stable, even despite some of the, you know, the the uh, Russia Ukraine uh, conflict uh, that has introduced some uncertainty in addition to, you know, foreign exchange fluctuations. So that has been stable, which has been great, and that's the largest piece of our business. The fastest growing one has been our e-signature business. Uh, we are the only other enterprise class alternative to DocuSign, uh, and we're more secure than DocuSign and have a better price per value than DocuSign. You know, DocuSign has largely not had a lot of competition uh, in the market for e-signature. And I think we're still very much in the early days of the e-signature market. And so we're, the market's waking up to us. Uh, our brand isn't as well known. We're probably the best, most widely used e-signature platform outside of a DocuSign, but we, we private label everything. So you would never know it. But, but uh, our brand is getting better known. And so we're getting pulled into much larger deals. And that has been driving you know, our, our growth rates on the e-signature side, um, you know, uh, better than any other product line inside of the company right now. Are you seeing a similar type of customer using the e-signatures who's using your security solutions? Or are these two fairly different customer profiles? That's a great question. Um, uh, today, they're, they're, they're different, but they're coming together. So, uh, you know, e-signature historically has been purchased as a capability to automate a, a physical paper process, right? And that has been largely... Uh, driven by uh, the digital transformation officer or chief uh, uh, digital products officer inside of the company. Uh, and uh, and our security products have been done more on the online banking uh, owner uh, or maybe even a senior security professional. But increasingly, people are realizing, particularly for you know contracting and other types of uses for e-signature that are externally focused or revenue focused, you have to get the signer right. So, you know, identity verification, authentication, any signatures becoming incredibly important. And in fact, Gartner came out and said that e-signature is becoming a feature, and I wholeheartedly agree to it, right? What you're really doing is providing cloud-based workflow, of which some transactions need to have a piece of paper associated with them, but it's critical that you get the customer right. And so you're seeing these two things come together as a joint offering, and they really have to go that way, right? If you if you if you're if you're doing business with a hacker. 
it's not valid. <laughs> so you need to make sure you get it right for both regulatory and security purposes. I wanted to talk a little bit about the market landscape. I know you discussed the signature side, but I'd love to hear a little bit more on the identity verification and authentication side. If you're, a if you're in a competitive bid situation, who are you coming across most frequently and what do you feel set, what sets one span apart from some of your peers? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. You know, the identity space is so big. I mean, everything seems to be identity these days, right? Uh, we operate in a fairly, um, you know, I would say strategic, but smaller portion of the identity space um, uh, where we do identity verification, identity proofing and authentication really for um, business processes, for lack of a better term, you know, uh, online banking, mortgages, things of that nature. And so we would com typically compete with, uh, on the external side, uh, maybe a Jamalto. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, who has uh, similar capabilities in the token, you know, RSA from time to time, you know, once in a while, we may see uh, transmit security and passwordless security. That's that to us as a feature that we do. But if a customer is looking to implement identity and uh, access management infrastructure, you know, so from time to time, we'd compete with them. And then, uh, you know, well, once in a while, uh, Yubico with their YubiKey product, uh, and then that's on the security side. Gotcha. What do you feel sets your approach at once been apart, maybe from the Jamalo Talis as well as some of these smaller startups? You know, listen, they're they're all good companies. That, you know, our stuff just works and works well, right? I mean, if uh, if we go down, banks go down, right? Uh, and and that that's our heritage, you know. So I think it's the the uh, the enterprise class nature of it. Uh, we're able to support global companies. Global, we're present in over a hundred countries, uh, and our background is you know bank. Right. And, and that's not for the faint of heart. Right. So it's been that way since we were a small startup uh, in the Vasco days. And we've grown up with that as our core. So if you want a product that works and is resilient and, uh, you know, highly available, use our stuff. Right. And uh, I think that sets us apart from a lot of the startups. It's just the, the 30 years of history and trust that we've built up in, in high volume, high transaction environments like banks. I see. Wanted to talk a little bit about the macro economy as well. And I have a two part question for you here. First is with the rising interest rates, inflation, supply chain issues, et cetera. How has that affected customer buying behavior in recent months? And then secondly, what, if any, changes or adjustments have you made internally at one span in response to the changing market dynamics? Yeah, no, no, it's a great, a great question. So, you know, complicated environment out there. I don't know any CEO that's happy about it, right, And uh, including myself. Um, but I would say it's really been twofold. On one hand, we're fortunate that, uh, you know, because of the, um, you know, presence we have in the online banking community global, that's not going away, right? And so, you know, uh, that, that, that's that been good for us. Uh, on the security side, because we do actually make physical tokens, uh, we have had some challenges with supply chain. And, uh, you know, I spoke about them at nauseum, the China challenges, you know, the, one, the no COVID policy, all of that stuff. Apple uh, obviously is changing their production capabilities because of that. So we do have a physical product that, uh, has been impacted with some of our uh, SKUs, uh, you know, from, from that side of the house. On the signature side, it's really interesting. I mean, we're embedded in people's processes. So we actually have downstream visibility when a bank or a mortgage platform is using us or refinancing. So obviously the interest rates have really changed uh, the nature of the transaction volumes in the BFSI vertical, right? And so I would say that has slowed down, right? In the past, you would have people buying uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, tiers of transaction volumes and going through them and the, the heady days with low interest rates and the opposite is happening now, right? And so uh, the other thing we've seen from time to time is that, uh, you know, uh, you know, sometimes the top 10 list for IT projects gets whittled down to a, a top five or top three, right? And uh, where e-signature falls into that category is really a company by company assessment. Uh, security always falls in the top five for the most part, uh, but e-signature is a little bit different. Not saying it's discretionary, but you'll see projects be pushed from time to time, depending on the company's, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, financial health, if you will. And so, what has this meant for you at once? Then, have you had any workforce reductions? Have you reorganized in response to some of these changing market dynamics? No, uh, no, we actually haven't. I mean, we've actually been doing pretty well, all things considered, right? Um, you know, we did, uh, uh, did we did a, do do a realignment uh, right after I came on board. You know, the old. The old saying that if you if, if you change your strategy, you don't move people or dollars, you didn't align to it, right? And so we did do an exercise, um, you know, about six months ago to really align our company to our Web 3.0 strategy. But outside of that, uh, knock on wood, we've been we've been fortunate. Um, you know, we're heads down trying to 
trying to build a really important company here. So, um, you know, we've been, uh, because of our foothold in the online banking space, uh, we've been maybe buffered a little bit more than other companies might be given the nature of our product set. So as you look ahead, what are some of the biggest bets you're hoping to make to capture this opportunity around Web 3.0? You know, I, I really do believe in my heart, I'm a 25 year security professional, and I do believe that, you know, we need to move to uh, move from a product world to a problem solving world. And the problem nowadays is no one knows who they're interacting with online and they're conducting transactions of consequence. You know, if you look at the way the Internet's evolved from 1.0 to 2.0 to what's coming in 3.0, and even if you think about 4.0, which people have already started to talk about in symbiotic relationships with machines and data and all that stuff, the security threats have been getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, there's never been more account takeovers. There's never been more credit loss, fraud, social engineering, right? Now we're getting into a situation where we've clearly seen economic warfare, corporate warfare taking place. And so it's a mess. Right. And, I, and so, you know, we have this always had this juxtaposition where the Internet gets more and more and more powerful. The security companies are reacting to it and they take products to go solve these point, you know, problems we have. We need to really think holistically. And how do we stitch security through the business process from start to finish? And you can do that while delivering a great user experience. And so, you know, no one is going to suffer a, a, a bad user experience. I mean, that's been the bane of security, which is security gets in the way. You're the department of no. You're locking things down. Zero trust. Zero trust doesn't work on the Internet. Maybe to protect your company. But now you're engaging with a consumer that if you deliver a bad user experience or have too much step up multi-factor authentication or too many clicks to check out, everybody wants one, one click checkout. We're conditioned to that as consumers. And so I think the IT security space has to move from IT to the world of enterprise engaging in a B2B to C transaction. And so with that requires a completely different way of thinking. It's not delivering a product to protect an endpoint, a payload of the network infrastructure. So how do you deliver a capability that is seamlessly integrated across multiple steps while ensuring a great user experience that hasn't been done by security companies yet? Um, so that's where we're hard to work at. Be interesting to watch. Matt, thank you so much here for the time. Michael, thank you so much. Great to see you as always. Yourself as well. We've been speaking with Matt Moynihan. He is president and CEO at OneSpan. For Information Security Media Group, this is Michael Novenson. Have a nice day.